communism is dead. And it's buried so deep that the corpse seems to be lost forever. Though we should never underestimate roaming specters. Social democracy is dead as well. Poisoned day after day in the good care of capitalism. A victim of its extravagant demands. As for capitalism, well, it looks like we are almost there. Actually, we are not only almost there, but already there, and even beyond it. Capitalism is already dead, didn't you know? Well, it might be, because no obituary has ever been published. It died without us, as strange as it may sound. In fact, it didn't really die. Rather, we died for it. That's the magic trick. Both economic and rhetorical, we are talking about here. A simple swap between reality and fiction. Literally. As simple as that. Just two words swapped in the book of life. But with dire consequences. While we thought we were setting the frame, we were actually being framed. And once we realized it, it was already too late. In 2008, following the subprime crisis, capitalism should have crumbled altogether. The demise of Lehman Brothers, the epitome of American capitalism, should have been followed by that of all the major financial institutions, which in turn would have damaged the real economy, and the whole system would have collapsed like a house of cards. The panic was spectacular enough with just Lehman Brothers, so imagine the entire system once today's corporate offices become tomorrow's ruins. But despite the woods and the shoots, it didn't. Not because capitalism is invincible, as we might be inclined to believe, but because the rules of the game were suddenly changed, and without the player's consent. Unwilling to watch the whole capitalistic system fail, some invisible hand, not Adam Smith's this time, but the iron fist of the most powerful states on Earth, using the illusion of public interest to better serve private interests, came to its rescue with several bailout plans representing amounts of money that are hard to conceive. The bailouts, discussed over a cup of Earl Grey by Ben Bernanke and Henry Paulson, two powerful advocates of private interests in prominent public positions, simply took $16 trillion of tax money and used it as a line of credit for companies without any guideline as to how the money should be spent, which infuriated leftists. Keynesians and free market hardliners alike. We figured, hey, that 16 trillion is still a hundred times less, or is it a thousand, than the value of all existing derivatives combined. 1.6 quadrillion dollars, or 20 times the world's GDP. That should be enough to fund a new country, let alone an alternative society. With that kind of currency, utopia is a bargain. But wait! In fact, nothing happened. Money was injected until the course of things was reverted, and capitalism saved. If it hadn't cost more than the world itself, in currency and in ideology, that would only be a technicality. Free marketism's laissez-faire doxa was simply suspended. Now that the markets were unable to regulate themselves, and needed some outside help to avoid bankruptcy. It looked like old Maynard could be dusted off and returned to service. Suddenly, state interventionism wasn't as bad as Milton Friedman and his posse had been hammering for years, with superiority and self-righteous contempt. It became an economic state of emergency. Only Lehman Brothers wasn't rescued, because you need a black sheep to become the sacrificial lamb and because the risk it had taken had rendered it unrescuable. Lehman Brothers stands as our last glimpse of reality, 
before our senses got tricked into approaching the fiction trap of the bailouts and fell into it. This set, the bailouts, didn't only deprive us of our reality. Changing the rules in the middle of the game and without the consent of all the players is not only fraud, but also the betrayal of one's fundamental principles. The bailouts were a treacherous, deceitful operation, but they did the trick. The system was rescued, but at the expense of unrealized utopias, let alone reality. Not only have we lost our neoliberal souls, which forbid any intervention on markets that are supposed to regulate themselves like well-oiled machines, but we have created a fake reality, or rather a seemingly real fiction, or a realized virtual reality in place of the actual reality that has now been virtualized. Reality has been impeached, disabled, and replaced with a decoy. At the end of the day, the bailouts provided us with a fictitious life that we pretend goes on undisturbed, while our reality, capitalism's end, nothing less, sits unrealized. The fiction we are living on now is like credit without underlying assets. Like a derivative derived from another derivative. Itself derived from and so on and so on and so on. It's just thin air. It's nothing new, though. Financial operatives have been cheating the books with these kinds of maneuvers ever since finance was invented. Take Lehman Brothers' famous Repo 101 trick, which features assets and cash swapped out just for the time it takes to conduct an audit, virtually a millisecond. Once the company has been given its clean bill of health, the assets and cash are swapped back. Like art or magic, finance mobilizes technicality, imagination, the ability to convince and mobilize resources, and the manipulation of perception. Swapping reality and fiction is quite an incredible feat, one that even Houdini wouldn't have dared imagine in such blunt terms. We have now landed in a life of illusion, yet without Houdini's talent for stunt performance and escape acts. Where is the exit? How can we get out of this nightmare? Once we have given up escaping and have become obedient soldiers of globalized capitalism, what we need then is entertainment. And entertainment that's not about illusion, but something real or seemingly real. Like the history of economy in the best suitable media. Does Capital as a telenovela? The wealth of nations on Facebook? or Bakunin streamed life from the streets of the world. But above all, we need an Eisenstein to capture capitalism on its deathbed, in the intensive care ward of the prestigious hospital of dialectics. This is prime material for tomorrow's television. The film, or rather a TV series with numerous sequels, would be a hospital drama, with a number of ideologies, next of kin or remote relatives, coming to pay their last respects to ailing capitalism. The imminent death drives the tension high between the main characters, the Keynesian nurse, constantly checking whether there is enough fluid in the IV, the communist doctor, torn between his commitment to care and his anger at capitalism's bad actions, the unionized social worker doing good deeds from nine to five, the man of religion here to administer the patient's last rites, and the hospital director, so obsessed about budgets that he dreams of Excel spreadsheets. The picture would be all hospital-wide and slightly soft-focused, merging the real-life hospital and the realm of the esoteric that Eisenstein was so fond of. As for the sound, it would be dominated by the regular beeping of monitors, sounding like minimalist techno music, with footsteps echoing in long hallways leading to the world. The editing of the 90-minute drama and multiple sequel TV series would follow the very principles formulated by Eisenstein, dialectics from television to the iPhone. 
But what, in our hospital, would be today's bowl of soup, prepared by the worker's wife, to keep him from going hungry and therefore revolutionary? The air everyone breathes, the life-giving fluids from the Kinsian nurse's IV, or the liquidities that lubricate the economy. Money is the perfect upgrade to soup, which itself was the perfect upgrade to water. If communism was Soviet power plus the electrification of the whole country, capitalism must be ruthless selfishness plus liquidification and derivatification of all assets. The film would be a white, liquid movie, with each drop of the ivy sounding as dramatic as in a horror movie. But wake up! Come back to our fake reality. Economy is movement. Capitalism is movement. Finance is movement. Even Karl Marx had rituals of movement, and chief among them was dance. Marx wasn't a bad dancer at all, contrary to what some scholars might assume. The fact that he was suffering from several ailments meant that he couldn't sit still for long. His life was therefore made of movement, on scales large and small, from Trier to Paris, to Brussels to Cologne to London but also crisscrossing each of these cities on a daily basis, running errands, evading the police, or in a situationist kind of derive, hundred years before the term was coined. He would also pace back and forth in the apartment or the library while writing to relieve his discomfort, so dancing must have been a natural state for him. A way of going from one place to another, guided by rhythm and melody, which isn't so different from economic or historical patterns. Basically, a relief from static pain and clocked ideas. That's probably why he understood capitalism, which is movement in essence, so well. Marx used to practice with his own private ballroom baroness, his wife Jenny van Westphalen. Carol and Jenny danced on many occasions, among others at the 1848 Workers' Union Ball in Brussels, where the democratic dance floor no longer had a cordon between commoners and aristocrats. Marx, now a bewitched dance floor phenomenon, turned and twisted his way through highly coordinated partner dances and quadrilles like no other. The lubricant, or the equivalent of Eisenstein's bowl of soup on the dance floor, was indeed beer, which Marx drank in substantial quantities. He had begun his habit as a student in Bonn, a time of rampaging and wild drinking. Alcohol, at once an integral part of working class culture and a major social health problem, didn't make it into Marx's theory, though. Sadly, dance didn't either, aside from a line about making the petrified conditions dance by playing them their own tune in a contribution to the critique of the Hegelian philosophy of right, probably the only reference to music and dance in Marxist theory until recently. But as you can see, this was rather a metaphor. There is also the figure of the dancing table, which appears a couple of times in Capital, but it was definitely more about spiritualism than dance, or in other words, more Eisenstein than Marx since our cinematography, Hegel, had interests as peculiar as mysticism, spiritualism, chirognomony, graphology, and Rosicrucians. That said, dance, like finance, has tremendously changed since the 1840s. In Marx's time, dance was still an elite pastime, while now it's the most democratic form of cultural expression the epitome of popular culture, the art of the masses. Dance floors are neutral spaces where high and low not only mingle, but even flirt. There are no more distinctions, just waiting together, promiscuous bodies dancing to the beat. Dance, with its physicality, can resist the abstract notion of finance and reveal the problematic relationship between capital and the body. Dance is also the ultimate present expanding into other dimensions, like the future, which is the very tense of financial capital. Capitalism is based on risk, and the wager that tomorrow will be better than today. But now that today seems better than tomorrow's prospects, capitalism still is about anticipation, even of the downfall. 
No capitalism, no future. It's as simple as that. And in the meantime, risk has become the most lucrative commodity and the core of the financial system. So here we are, risk and movement. And where there is movement, there is risk, and there is dance. If 19th century mom and pop accumulation capitalism could still be linked to ballet, a leftover dance from the royal court taken over by the rising bourgeoisie, today's derivatives markets would be a piece of music, automatically tuned, played very loud yet impossible to hear. That said, derivatives are as danceable as anything else. Every commodity is danceable. Whether it's real or fictitious doesn't matter, as long as it can dance. But before we hit the dance floor, let's update the Marx dancing quadrille with beer as a psychoactive lubricant paradigm. From the Industrial Revolution through to World War I, the dance floor gradually becomes democratic. By the time we reach the Roaring Twenties, we are swinging to the big band and drinking contraband booze, with opium as a downer. Just think of Bessie Smith singing any bootleg sure is a pal of mine. Temperance was the official ideology of the prohibition. But interestingly, hard liquor is what we now remember, along with rakish mobsters and glamorous speakeasies. The post-World War II years still featured big bands, more often than not white and with a bleached smile, like cute and innocuous Glenn Miller, hero of Europe's liberation soundtrack and a famed exponent of the most boring form of jazz ever performed, on Marlboros and Budweiser with limited psychoactive effect indeed. In the 1950s and 60s, there is nothing of interest aside from the last moments of partner dance, rock and roll, practiced by already obsolete baby boomers in a time of sweeping individualism. We then glide towards the 1980s, this strange decay that saw the birth of AIDS and the death of 1960s progressive ideals also brings us financial capitalism. Best embodied by a Lehman Brothers executive, Besh Suet, or cream-colored, because cash rules everything around me. Ray-Ban aviator glasses with photochromic lenses, and an arrogant green dancing the shift from disco to new wave, sniffing coke and inhaling poppers in the men's room of some city club. That's where the 80s is, if you are old enough to remember. And if not, trust your elders' recollections. As for the 90s and the odds, they had only creeping new liberalism and rave parties where ecstasy was cheap and widely available. And dance was carried out way beyond the end of the night, a nerve-wracking vibration more than a voluptuous movement of the body. To each economic model, it's music, dance and psychoactive lubricant. The economy is a beat we all have to dance to, all the time, 24-7. But guess what the financial crisis yielded? Automated MP3 loops, downloadable for free from whatever.com. Soulless, prefab music for tire type pads. Boring, repetitive rhythms to dance to mechanically until the end of capitalism. The lubricant? Bad salts. Hey, we have the high we deserve. There is every chance these bad salts will send you to the hospital, confused and disoriented and you will be admitted to the same world as ailing capitalism, thus lending the privilege of seeing it die. We are now left with a single hope, namely, that reality and fiction will swap back their places, and that from the ruins of capitalism, new movements and new dances will arise. We know that the quality of today's ruins will inform the nature of tomorrow's revolution. It's the yin and the yang of progress and reaction. Now that capitalism could be dying, if only fiction and reality could revert to their initial, real places, it might be time to let go. The word finance comes from the French fan, the end, and means finishing a deal, settling a debt. So let's settle this $16 trillion debt and get it over with. Enough missed opportunities. Let's eat the psychoactive bowl of soup. And let's dance until the end of capitalism.
political self-interest is nowhere somehow than economic self-interest. Revolution is about to happen. Capitalism is about to die. We do have a plan. We're working on it. And I do think that we will get it stabilized and we'll see the recession coming to an end. We do have a plan. We're working on it. Any economic system that doesn't deliver for very large groups in the population, doesn't deliver for a majority of citizens, is an economic system that is failing. That period, I thought we were pretty close to a, a global financial meltdown. We do have a plan. We're working on it. We discovered, if not the best possible, at least the least bad system. Liberal democratic capitalism. Liberal democratic capitalism. We do have a plan. We're working on it. Liberal democratic capitalism. Capitalism is like stuff. And that's difficult to comprehend for a lot of people. Your company is now bankrupt. Our economy is in a state of crisis. But you get to keep $480 million. I, I have a very basic question for you. Is this fair? We do have a plan. We're working on it. Is this fair? What is credit? Credit is what enables individuals to spend more than the resources they have available at that moment. One has to realize that credit is different from ordinary commodities. Credit can be created out of thin air. We do have a plan. We're working on it. Finance sells something it does not have. Hence, it is extremely creative in order to create instruments that allows it to invade other economic sectors. Marx was wrong on a whole series of points. The first part of the crisis was subprime and other assets that were toxic. Now we're in a second phase, which is that the economy is very weak. So the economy's weakness has meant that uh, some of the uh, initial attempts to stabilize the banks haven't been enough. We've had to do more. We do have a plan. We're working on it. Capitalism brought a demand for democracy. Capitalism is life Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea to run on? Well, first of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? You think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? What is greed? Liberal democratic capitalism. We do have a plan. We're working on it. Capitalism is about to die. The value of financial assets as measured 
by derivatives, outstanding derivatives, which is a classic measure, was $630 trillion. Today, it's more than a quadrillion. Now that's a lot of zeros. We do have a plan. We're working on it. Ed Stearns was only one, then they started working on Lehman Brothers and Merrill, then they started working on AIG, now they started yesterday and today taking apart Morgan Stanley and even Goldman Sachs. We do have a plan, we're working on it, and even Goldman Sachs. Capitalism is by side. The government has de facto delegated responsibility for the creation and allocation of credit to private banks. Government could take a more direct role uh, in the provision of credit, of, of making use of this scarce resource, their own trust. We do have a plan. We're working on it. But where, where does Marxism come in in this? Where does Marxism as a tool, not of historical yeah. analysis, but of future conduct, where does that help us? We all agree this was a mega ethico-political catastrophe. We do have a plan. We're working on it. Liberal democratic capitalism. We do have a plan. We're working on it. We're working on it. We're working on it. We're working on it. Working on it. I think in society where there are enormous differences between very great wealth and very great poverty, I would recoil from that.